as we continue to worship the Lord together, uh, I'm going to draw your attention to uh, uh, a scripture reading out of out of First uh, Timothy uh, chapter three, and it starts verse one. Here is a trustworthy saying: Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a matter worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, nor, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace, disgrace and into the devil's trap. I think uh, we have uh, leadership challenges in front of us. And this is a delightful passage, by the way, and so we're, we're not going to end up trying to be too, too heavy, but, but the scripture is what the scripture is. Uh, and let me, by introduction, just say um, we are, as leaders, lives under examination. We can't help it. Uh, and lest, lest you think you're exempt, fathers who are to be head of households are, by the way, in leadership. And so this is a broad cover, and while it's talking about uh, elders of the church or those who are ev um, overseers, um, the applications go throughout the entire body of Christ. And so let's not look at this just as a qualification for eldership. By the way, uh, deacons, which is the term servant, uh, follows, and, and the word says, likewise, servants. Likewise, deacons, those who are serving around. And if you're in service, by the way, you are uh, called a doulos, a servant. And, and we are all that, at least. And th so the broad context of leadership here uh, doesn't really need to be, to be uh, explained other than together we are life under examination. And who examines us? Uh, we do. We, we, we are allowed to examine one another and encourage one another to love and good work. So, so this is not something that only God sees. No, no. By definition, in leadership, it's something that we see. We visualize what God's doing in one another's lives. And so we're the ones who hold one another accountable. Secondly, I just want to say we are a complementarian church. Uh, you may not know what that means or care. All, all that means is that we are a church that, that believes that the Bible allows men and women to be equal but have different roles. And so the distinction between men and women is clear scripturally, and I know the world has all kinds of discussion about that, and we can have more discussion about that as we go on. But let it be said, we are, ega we are not egalitarian. Now, egalitarian believe that we're, we're all equal in everything that can be said and done. So, and, so, and so our differentiation is we are equal, but there are different roles for men and for women as we think Scripture clears that up. Thirdly, this is all about keeping the foundation of the body strong. So we don't want to make any mistake about this. This is, this is about the health and the vitality of the local church. So let's get into this. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Here's something you can trust. Here's a trustworthy saying. Hey, you can believe me. How many used car salesmen have said that? Have I got a deal for you? Well, this is very different. It's not that context at all. This is, here's something you can actually trust. It's a trustworthy saying. What's following, you can believe. Whoever desires, which is really an interesting way of framing this. If you desire to be an overseer or be in leadership, well, wait a minute, that's not just given? Well, no, it's actually not just given. You're not, you're not necessarily 
the only one that desires to have some sort of responsibility in the body of Christ. Now, that's a serious thing. Who, whoever desires this, whoever wants to be in leadership, and, and I'll tell you this, not everybody does. But if you do, fantastic. You're allowed to desire those things. I think that God puts that in your heart to desire it. I worked on the railroad road, uh, out west as a spiker. So I, I uh, had my share of uh, bloody knees and shins as spikes would bounce up and hit me. I still want to have a discussion with those who designed a round spike and a round hammer. I don't get that. To this day, I don't get that. There is one guy who worked along with us. He was probably about 70 years of age, the age I am now. And, and I, was, I was only in my 20s when I was doing this. So he has 40 years on me, and he wanted to be a spiker. And, and, and the offer came down the line for somebody who would like to operate the machine. And this machine would go along. You pull a butt, pull, pull a lever, and it would raise the tracks up. And so, so the old ties would move out, and then the new ties would put in, then he'd lower it. And, and, and that was a cushy job, and you got paid more. Why? Because it was a machine. And you were, you know, you understood to be a machine operator. And, and so I asked this guy, I go, hey, man, there's nobody that would say no to you. If you want to drive that machine, you say, you say, go for it. He goes, I don't want it. You don't want that? It's more money, and it's easier? No, no, no. I don't want the responsibility. He knew ultimately it was a different way that people would look at them. And so it is with leadership. And some of you don't, don't need or care for any of that kind of responsibility. You've got enough responsibilities on your own. And it's okay to say no. It's just perfectly okay to say no. Why? Well, because I have kids. I have a husband. I have a wife. Enough said. Your plate is full. But if you desire, then that's a noble thing. And I do believe God is raising up leadership who desire such things. Whoever desires, and this is a fun thing, it's a noble task. So, so lest you think um, um, that, that, that elevation to authority is going to just weigh you down and be just so impossibly, but no, no, it's a noble task. There are its own rewards it's a wonderful thing. You, you, get, you get rewarded in ways that you can't even believe. I know there's more stuff to do. And people, but, but listen, those who are desiring it are probably built for it. It's okay. Let's look at number two. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach. Faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able, able to teach. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Let's take a look at this. It's something you become. Leadership, and, and here specifically, is something that you grow into. It's a lifestyle. It's something you become, and the evidence is how you act. This becomes like it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to see what God has done and how, how he's built you. Uh, you're even-tempered. Now... Who doesn't have flashes of distemper? There's shots for that, by the way. <laughs> and I need it when I go on a golf course. I should be taking shots. But generally speaking, they're even-tempered. They can, they can control themselves. They're faithful to those they love. That's huge. The, the exhibition of faithfulness to people that God has put in your life. And this is specifically talking about wives. Faithful. Hospitable. Able to make people feel at home. It's part of the gift sets. And for those who are in leadership, hospitality is a thing. Hospitality is not something we let others do. Those in the kitchen and those... No, no, no. Hospitality actually is, is how you treat and how you allow people to feel at home. Able to speak. Well, there's a good thought. It doesn't mean you have to be eloquent. It doesn't say that. It says 
you should be able to teach, to open God's word and, and walk through. And some of you may be thinking, well, I, I, can't, I can't do what Pastor Rob does or what. No, no, exactly. But if you've got a household and you can sit around a table and open the Bible and say, let's talk about what this story is about. Beautiful. Gentle. Leaders in the church are not brutes. They don't gang up on, they don't yell at you. In learning, in learning to be hospitable, that carries through. In learning to be faithful, that carries through. The even-temperedness carries through. Gentleness. When we handle people, it's not, it's, it's not like the world would handle people if they make a mistake. No, we actually are prone to guide them through. It's an opportunity for discipleship. We get a chance to gently bring people alongside. Every once in a while, every once in a while, discipline's necessary. But it's never out of anger. Discipline, scripturally, is always, 100% of the time, there to bring people back into fellowship. Discipline is not an angry, get out of here, let's deal with you kind of an action. Not biblically. Gentle. Here's a cute one. Doesn't love money. What? <laughs> it's, is it important? The Bible talks a lot about money, and it is important. It's important to, to put bread on your table. It's important to do the things. It's important to, to give back to God. It's important for tithing and offering. It's, it's all there for you. It, but, but the love of money, which is the root of evil, so, so what we're saying is, if that becomes your God, you have a challenge. In leadership, in the church, if you love money, Allow it to be your God. It becomes an idol. It's what you become about. Then you're going to have trouble being in leadership of Christ because you're going to be divided. Is that clear? I would, I would, I would, think, I would think that's pretty simple. Let's, let's do three. Let's go to number three. He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders. I love that. That's a really interesting, we'll talk about it. So that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So let's look at this. It is the war that the devil is engaged in. This is part of a devil opportunity. So leadership, beware that, that the enemy has eyes on you. The enemy has tactics, and he, and he will try to get us to do all kinds of things. There are some very common vulnerabilities that we all have. We are vulnerable, and the devil knows that. So here's the deal. If you're a recent convert, then, then that means you don't know all kinds of stuff. At least you don't know the bare minimum, and so, and so you're going to be susceptible to all kinds of things. One of them is to be conceited. Look, I'm a leader now. Now, all that's said is right there. Oh, look. And if you need people's attention to give you validity, that's not a right thing. In anything. Because if you need people's approval, then you're going to at some point have to ignore what the Bible says. And the Bible says something, we have to be strong in that area and not be susceptible what people might happen to think. Conceited. That conceitedness is the same judgment as the devil. What, what, what happened to the devil? What happened to Satan? Well, he wanted to be God. <laughs> not, no pride there. He was an angel, and a beautiful one, an esteemed one, but it wasn't enough, and so he desired to be God. And so God threw him out. God removed him. And this world here, in the region that he operates in, outside of our sight and sound is his domain. 
And so we don't want to fall into a pattern that he established by being conceited in leadership. Same judgment comes. That's strong. Same judgment you, you, you dance with if you become conceited in leadership. You fall into that same judgment, which ultimately is rejection. Ouch. So pray carefully. Pray carefully as you're asked and talked about. Not, not because you can't do it, but because what, what and why am I allowing myself to be in leadership? Good question. Now, a lot of people should be that are scared off by that. Let me just tell you, leadership is something that's gifted and God will protect. And so if we follow simple guidelines, you are protected. And hopefully there's enough wise men around that can come alongside you and say, Rob, when you said that, that sounded a little bit arrogant. Oh, okay. And if my response is tough, that's how God built me, then you have your answer. I don't deserve to be in leadership. If I apologize and am contrite and ask what I should do then in order to improve, then you're spot on. Teachability is one of the great assets. I like this last one here, good public reputation. And that good public re reputation is, is vital not only in the health of the body, because then we are not talked about out there because so-and-so is... I uh, served under a pastor who just happened to come from England, uh, actually, I think Scotland, and his, uh, and his, so forgive me for Scottish and English that I messed that up, but it was Scotland. And, uh, and he loved football and, in our terms, soccer, and, uh, and uh, coached a team, and his son happened to be on the team. And somebody came to me, and I was on sort of a volunteer staff, and he said, uh, is so-and-so a pastor? I go, yes. Do you, want, do you want to hear what he said on the field to the referees? I said, no. But I'll hear it anyway. And so he told me, and he said, do I talk to somebody? I just said, leave it to me. Immediately, we're talking about a reputation that's outside the church. And the impact of that to the church. People, and I don't care who you are, how you act, how you talk, reflects upon the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter if the referees are stupid. It's not up to you to tell them. I mean, sometimes you do. But. So confession, in times past, I was kicked out of hockey, hockey rinks because I had too much to say to referees. You know who talked to me? My son, who was a little guy. You know what he said? Dad, don't do that anymore. <laughs> and so I didn't. People, it's so easy. It's, it's just absolutely easy. And we think, oh, it's just that. It's just, no, no, no. I was, I was uh, a bystander at, at a Christian University hockey game, and, and, and there was uh, quite the fist fight that broke out. Uh, two Christian universities going right at it. A lot of those students were, were in class for leadership. They're in pastoral roles, and, and, and somebody said, well, you know, boys will be boys, and I, I get that. So, you know, sometimes stuff happens. But it was the attitude after, and one guy came to me, and I said, you know you represent God in the school, and he said, no, not on the ice. <laughs> now, now, we laugh, but folks, we have that same kind of mentality sometimes. That's there, that's Sunday morning, that's during, you know, Bible study, but here, different rules apply. No, they don't. Who, who gave you that idea? Well, I'll tell you who, the enemy. 
The enemy loves that stuff. But, but it impacts, it impacts. Same judgment as the devil, good reputation. You don't want to be disgracing the body of Christ. Let's look at the word addiction, addiction for servant leaders. And so, and so this, this comes in as way, the way we behave. And, and it talks about here not, not given to wine or not habitually uh, be wine bibbers or, or essentially alcoholics. But, but that was just for then. And it's really about a habit that controls you. Habits that lead young believers to harm. Habits that are off limits to the Holy Spirit. If you in any way are saying, well, that's, that's just me and the Holy Spirit doesn't have an opportunity to touch me there, you are, you're really in trouble. It, it's an addiction that you're saying is bigger than God and therefore my idol. Habits that control you. Verse 4 says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. It's a powerful, it's a powerful statement. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth? In case I don't come for a while, or maybe I don't come at all. Maybe you're on your own here, and so I'm writing these instructions to you, so why? So the church of Jesus Christ can stay strong. People, we are the body of Christ. We are the representations of it. And so these are not just for elders. These are about keeping next generation strong. So if I'm delayed or can't come, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. This is important, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. So what's our take home today? Let's look at it. It's not good to rely on one person. We are a body. And we have a number of leaders that are chosen to represent and to hold these things to us and be models of that for us. It's not one person's job. When you bring in a new pastor, it's like, good, he can be our model. Well, time out. Every pastor is going to blow it at some level, and so, and so how, how you recuperate from that is, is really the name of the game. That's okay. We're not perfect. The issue about how we treat our leadership is to be, hey, we're in it with you, and we will walk you through this together. We are together the body of Christ. I have certain gift sets, and I'm held to a standard that you hold me to, and if I mess up, you are responsible to help bring me in. It's great. It's a great system. And if you happen, and in this case, there are a plurality of elders, there are, are people here that, that have eldership strengths, they are apt to teach, and they do all of these things, they, they love their wives, they, all of that. And so we have several, and God willing, we'll have more. Will there be a lead? Yeah. Every, every group needs a lead, so there will be a lead pastor, but that doesn't mean... He does the eldering all by himself. See that the foundation lasts. That's a corporate mandate. Together today, our take home is, hey, I'm going to be responsible with them and to them to make sure that, that this foundation lasts. I'm going to keep the family habits. What family? Well, the family of the household of faith. We have habits. We have a culture. And our culture is a trustworthy saying. Let's talk about how we act as a family. And we are going to be, I am going to be, the church of the living God. Lord, I want to thank you for today. I do want to thank you for the opportunity we have just to take a look at leadership and how we can be engaged and how we're to look at it. And we've just touched on it. I mean, this is not the only time that you mentioned leadership and attitudes and behavior but it's certainly a key one. 
And so we pray that you would help us, allow us to be growers in the word. Continue to be mature and help one another towards maturity. We thank you for the way that you've allowed us to come under authority, your authority. And Lord, my prayer today is that you would place each of us in the role, in the task that you have designed for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.